Wesley is someone who's been involved in this issue for a very long time, since the 90s. And uh, sadly, I was talking about with him about organizing a, a special celebration when, we were, when he was approaching like, uh, you know, 25 years or, you know, pretty soon it'll be uh, 30 years pretty soon as to his involvement in this whole question of assisted suicide in the U.S. And he's certainly uh, uh, a great person for uh, not only speaking on the issue, but he regularly writes articles that are published and, uh, and shared by people throughout uh, the world on the question of assisted suicide and uh, euthanasia. I, I'm not sure that it's actually a cause for celebration that I've had to work this issue since 1993. Uh, when I started this work, uh, it was by accident almost. I had a friend uh, commit suicide under the influence of Hemlock Society. This was in 92. And at that time, I was writing books with Ralph Nader, and, and I was happy as a clam. It never occurred to me that I would ever be on the, these kinds of uh, issues. And um, I wrote a piece. I was so upset by her suicide. Her name was Frances. And, and if anybody has read my book, Forced Exit, the entire story, is in the introduction of that book. But I was so upset by her suicide and, and the suicide file that she had that I got to see, which was filled with Hemlock Society literature, telling her how to kill herself, telling her the drugs to use, telling her the um, how to use a plastic bag, uh, with uh, proselytizing uh, stories about good assisted suicides. And one still sticks with me all these years later, the person writing in the Hemlock Society, Hemlock Quarterly it was called, said, my loved one laughed and giggled and seemed to relish the experience. I mean, that sound you heard was my head exploding. We were talking about a suicide here. And so I was so upset by what happened and the influence these strangers put on my friend Francis had on her that I wrote a piece called The Whispers of Strangers in Newsweek and it came out in June of 1993. It's available online if anybody wants to read it. Uh, and they just uh, Google or being whatever, Wesley J. Smith, comma, The Whispers of Strangers, and it'll come up. And uh, I, I discussed how this was uh, very perilous for people who are weak and vulnerable. I, I really hadn't even uh, explored the issue in terms of uh, reading literature or anything. And I warned that we could end up having organ harvesting as a plumb to society uh, by accepting this kind of idea that killing is an acceptable answer to human suffering. And of course, as we'll discuss somewhat, that is exactly what happened. So that now in the Netherlands and Belgium, people with mental illnesses who are not otherwise ill go to hospitals, are killed, and they're harvested within five minutes of their deaths. And yet this has not caused a great outcry, even in the organ uh, a donation and organ surgery community, organ um, uh, medical community. So uh, what happened after that was after my piece came out, I received so much hate mail. Now realize that this is at a time when if you wanted to tell me that, that you want me to die of cancer and hope I, I, I die a long and suffering death, which is about 150 letters doing that, you had to take, take something called a piece of paper and you had to uh, use something called a pen or a typewriter and put it on the paper. And then you actually paid for the experience of telling me to die of cancer by putting something called a stamp on an envelope. This was long before email. And I received so many letters uh, just furious with my piece, which I thought honestly was uncontroversial, that I thought, what happened to my culture and where was I when it happened? And that changed my entire trajectory of my life from that point on, because I ended up uh, being contacted by Rita Marker, uh, who runs the, now it's called the Patients Rights Council, it used to be called the International Anti-Euthanasia Task Force. And she asked me if, uh, if they could run my piece in, in her newsletter, which I said, of course. And I was saying to, to Rita, Rita, do you know? And she said, yes, Wesley, I know. Do you know that what they wanna do is she said, yes, Wesley, I know. And eventually, I, uh, I started to work with Rita. I said, well, let me give you 10% of my time. Uh, these are my skills. You know, I've, I've done a lot of talking head work on the television and radio, do a lot of writing. And she started feeding me. Uh, every day, I would get uh, uh, articles in the mail about this issue. Uh, and she was basically educating me about what was happening. 
And uh, so eventually it went to 20%, 30%, then 50%. And finally, uh, Ralph Nader uh, said to me, Wesley, why are you working on this euthanasia uh, material instead of our work? And I explained to him why I thought it was so important. And he said, you're right, absolutely, you know, basically go out and do it via con Dios. And, and so I began to focus full time on these efforts. And uh, so I've been doing it since 93, and uh, we have really put up a good fight. We've been overmatched in terms of resources. We've been uh, having to deal with really egregious media bias, where uh, at one point I, when I realized that uh, our side wasn't even going to get a chance to speak, um, there was a case, there was a story in a, in a major newspaper, it might have been the New York Times, it might have been the LA Times, something like that, in which uh, there was discussion was Jack Kevorkian, whether he was a positive or a negative to the, uh, to the pro-euthanasia movement and, and, to, and to society as a whole. And the only people presented in that article were Derek Humphrey, and as I recall, it might have been Barbara Coombs Lee. There was nobody with an opposing point of view, and I said, well, now we're officially invisible. So these are the issues that we're going to have to deal with. And I want to um, say how incredibly successful I think we've been, despite some of the things I'll get into, uh, over the last 25, 26 years, because we have held the line generally very well. And I think we can continue to do so uh, if we uh, follow some strategies that I have seen work and I've seen what doesn't work. Let me start with what doesn't work. What doesn't work is to make this a pro-life issue. What doesn't work is to make this about abortion. Because if you force people who are not a part of uh, the anti-euthanasia movement, if you say to them, if you want to give up, not have assisted suicide, you also have to give up abortion, many will say, well, then I'll take assisted suicide. And that, that may be unfortunate for people to hear. That may be something that we can lament, but it's true. So it's very important that this not be deemed the same thing as abortion, because uh, I believe that if it turns into a pro-life versus pro-choice kind of issue, that's how we lose. That's how we lost Oregon in 1994, which was the first state to, to other than Switzerland, which had done it in 42, to officially legalize assisted suicide. And that, that campaign won by 51 to 49 percent. And the reason it won was that the proponents were able to turn it into the Catholic Church wants to stop you from controlling your body. The pro-lifers want to tell you to stop controlling your body. And it was a pro-life versus pro-choice kind of uh, argument. That soon changed because something happened uh, in 94 that has really uh, helped the dynamic, particularly in the United States. And that was the entrance of the disability rights community into fighting assisted suicide and euthanasia because disability rights folk, and I'm speaking generally, but they tend to be very secular in their outlook. They're not religious. Uh, they tend to be uh, very liberal on the political spectrum. And again, this is a general, general statement. They tend to not be pro-life when it comes to abortion, but they saw themselves quite accurately as the targets of this movement, the ultimate targets. That what this movement is about is saying that people who have limitations, people with disabilities, as, as they, as disability rights advocates like to say, that we're all tabs, temporarily able-bodied. That eventually, if we live long enough and aren't hit by a truck, we'll begin to develop uh, uh, disabilities or, or inabilities to do things that we could do when we were younger. And what the, what the euthanasia movement is saying, and assisted suicide is saying that, that life with limitations isn't worth living. And the disability rights folks started, and, and they can be actually more in your face than we can. They started, their first uh, action was actually a sit-in demonstration at the Denver office of uh, what was still then called the Hemlock Society. And as you now know, it's called Compassion and Choices. They sure love their euphemisms on that side. And they did a sit-in where they actually had the uh, Hemlock people called the police to get them out. The other first action they did, or the second, I forgot which was first, they did a, a 
a street demonstration in front of Jack Kevorkian's house because most of the people he was assisting in suicide with carbon monoxide canisters, canisters were not actually terminally ill, even though that's how the media described it. Most of them were despairing people with disabilities. And so the disability rights folk really realized that, wait a second, this is a form of discrimination against us. And that is quite accurate. And at that point, the, the paradigm shifted from, well, this is just a pro-life, pro-choice movement, to the diversity of the opposition to legalizing assisted suicide, which consists of the medical, uh, the American Medical Association, for example, still opposes assisted suicide. Most medical associations, despite some efforts by advocates within them and from outside, still oppose assisted suicide. Disability rights activists, the Catholic Church, pro-life people, advocates for the poor, many in the civil rights community, LULAC, for example, a Latino um, civil rights group, uh, opposes assisted suicide. Uh, uh, because uh, in fact, one group that I worked with when, uh, in, when California was trying to legalize assisted suicide, the time before, the time we actually stopped it, not when they succeeded, and I lived in California in those years, is they called it death squad medicine. And they were hard left wing, almost, I would say, communist organizers. But they saw that the people that they were advocating for, which were the most destitute and the poor, were victimized by this because they people couldn't get ac adequate uh, access to health care, yet we were talking about ending their lives as a remedy for suffering. You see the same aspect happening in Canada right now. There was a study that said only 15%, one five, of people in Canada have access to adequate palliative care, and yet Canada has become one of the most radical pro-euthanasia societies in the world. So these are the kinds of uh, paradoxes that I think we need to highlight much more frequently and much more effectively. So let me go into some of the, um, I wanna have time for questions and discussion because I have a lot of uh, uh, institutional memory about the uh, move from uh, no states and countries formally legalizing except Switzerland to the circumstances we are now. And I think I have some understanding of why that is and, and when we've been successful and when we haven't. So what is the first step in preventing legalization in terms of through the democratic process, whether through a referendum or through legislation? And that's building coalitions. You have to build uh, what might be called strange political bedfellow coalitions uh, of the groups that I mentioned. I remember once I attended a demonstration in Sacramento and I was called out of line um, by a NPR, a public radio reporter, for an interview. And so I gave the interview and he said, what is the first thing you'd like us to know? And I said, take a look at those demonstrators. And you would see a nun praying the rosary followed by somebody in a wheelchair, followed by an African-American civil rights activist, followed by an advocate for the poor, followed by somebody who's in pro-life. And I said, that is the diversity, that euthanasia and assisted suicide is actually an agenda for the well-off, upper middle class and rich who know what they want for themselves and don't care who gets hurt if they get it in order for them to get it. So you saw in California at that time, the, the push for assisted suicide was coming from Marin County, which is probably the richest, if not, um, uh, if not at least certainly one of the richest counties in California. And so you find that people who really push for assisted suicide are the well-off and well-tailored. They are not people who have difficulty accessing services. They are not people who have difficulty getting quality medical care. They never are going to be pushed out of the lifeboat because they have uh, people who advocate for them and they have the ability to operate within the system, which sometimes can be very complex. So uh, you need uh, medical professionals, disability rights activists, pro-life people, people who are not pro-life so that we can break through the paradigm that this is somehow just a religious right issue because it's certainly not just a religious right issue. Secondly, I think that people have to make secular arguments. Uh, too often I've heard uh, very well-meaning people, but they'll, when somebody is advocating for assisted suicide, they'll say only God can take a life. Well, if somebody believes in God and believes in that aspect of, of faith, uh, that might work. But if somebody says back, well, I don't believe in God. Well, where are you going to go with the conversation 
uh, if you don't know how to present in a secular fashion. We live in the West in a secular, rational, they think, um, paradigm. And we have to be able to, to communicate from where people hear, not from where we want to present. So there are plenty of secular issues and secular approaches. One of the really great um, opponents of assisted suicide was my friend Nat Hentoff, the late Nat Hentoff, who was very much on the left flank of politics. He was a uh, almost an absolutist when it came to um, uh, uh, human rights and, and civil liberties. Uh, he was an atheist, a, a re repeatedly proclaimed atheist, and he, he wrote again and again against assisted suicide because he understood that this violated equal dignity. And if any of you, he, he, he passed away several years ago, but we became very good friends. And when he was awarded the um, Human Life Foundation, awarded him as a great defender of life, I was very honored because he asked me to introduce him at that event. And, and, if, and I urge all of you, go back and, and look up some of Nat's writings on assisted suicide. You won't see one mention of God. You won't see one mention of religion. But he talks about equality. He talks about people that are going to be uh, protecting the weak and vulnerable, because that's what we're about, protecting the weak and vulnerable. Sometimes I say, let's talk liberal. I'm not saying talk progressive, but talk liberal, because that is the lexicon that most people uh, communicate in today. So we have to be able to use the kind of arguments that people can hear. Uh, for people who are not of a, uh, a fundamentalist religious or deeply religious, and I'm not saying that in a pejorative way, um, mindset, if we talk too much about religiosity and souls and, and sin, they're going to tune out. And there aren't enough religious people to win this on their own. So we have to be able to, to get into the arena as it actually exists, not as we want it to be. Um, talk a lot about equality, because uh, I, I was very honored, in, in, in this is in my book, Culture of Death, the Age of Duhar Medicine. Uh, back in 2000, uh, Cecily Saunders, Dame Cecily Saunders, who created the modern hospice movement, um, gave me a half hour of her time at her, I was in London, uh, and I, I went to interview her for the book, St. Christopher's Hospice. What a great medical humanitarian. Ralph Nader once said to me, what a great tragedy it is that Jack of Orkin is the most famous doctor in the world. And at the time, Jack of Orkin was the most famous doctor in the world, and he was right. It was a terrible tragedy, and it showed you um, some of the decline, I think, that we see in our culture, the decadence uh, but again, this is the milieu in which we have to swim. The real one, the real great humanitarian, I think, was Dame Cecily, who created the modern hospice movement that dealt with making sure people have adequate palliative care, pain control, symptom control, who uh, made sure that people had access to social services, in-home care, uh, where people can, can uh, spend their final uh, weeks and months in the home. Uh, and, and also, by the way, suicide prevention for anyone who requests uh, to die now or requests suicide. That is an essential service at, of hospice as un, un, originally created as essential as pain control. And I asked her about that and she said, I'm dead set against assisted suicide because it denies the equal dignity of my patients. And she's absolutely right about that. And, and so we see a situation now where hospice is being corrupted. For people in hospice, uh, if someone asks for assisted suicide, say in Oregon or um, in uh, Canada, um, they don't get that suicide prevention. They get the lethal jab or the pills. And of course, in Canada, it's so bad that when one small 10-bed hospice called Dignity Hospice in British Columbia said, you know what, we're going to stick with the original hospice philosophy and not kill people in our hospice, not only because it denies their equal dignity, but what about the other patients in the other beds who are hearing that someone's coming to be killed? BC cut off their funding and they're being evicted. It's a 10-bed hospice. Why would they do that? because it isn't the 10 beds that has the, the culture of death advocates upset. It's the message, the message from a hospice that killing people is morally wrong and interferes with proper medical treatment 
of people who are terminally ill. So, so this is um, th this is something that that we have to really be able to focus on. We also have to look at our language, uh, even on uh, some of the most vociferous anti-euthanasia and assisted suicide uh, sites and articles. I hear people use the terminology of the opposition. I hear people call it aid in dying. Well, you are when you use their language. Because as uh, someone once said, he who defines the terms wins the debate. When you use their language, you have given them a huge boost. Never call it aid in dying. Never call it made. Never call it medical assistance in dying. Call it what it is, assisted suicide or euthanasia. Because that is accurate and descriptive. When the uh, pro-euthanasia people say, well, it's not really suicide because they're only wanting to kill themselves because they're terminally ill. And if they weren't terminally ill, they wouldn't really want to commit suicide. So it's not suicide. That's just sophistry because the person who wants to kill themselves because their children have died wouldn't want to kill themselves if their children hadn't died. So should we say that's not suicide either? It's ridiculous. <coughs> Excuse me. But the media goes along with it. So every time we talk, <coughs> We have to correct the language. When so, the, someone in the media says, well, what do you think of medical aid and dying? You say, well, I think that's a euphemism. It's not accurate and descriptive. It seeks to cover up what is really happening in this procedure because what you're really doing is you're ending life. You're saying that killing is an acceptable answer to human suffering. And you need to be accurate and you need to be descriptive in our language and, uh, and never concede that ground because that's about 30 to 40 percent of the debate alone. Aid in dying, the point of it is to cover up what is going on. The real aid in dying is people are people who work with hospice, the volunteers who go into the home, the, the home health care workers. I'm, I've been a hospice volunteer and I've seen the incredible good that can be done. I remember one case, a man was dying of colon cancer <clears throat> and a, a home health care worker came in and she gave him a sponge bath and she and she anointed his body with cream. He was being touched. You know what that meant to that man? You should have seen the look on his face. That's called compassion, which means to suffer with. What assisted suicide does is abandon. It discards. It doesn't suffer with. It doesn't walk the extra mile for the person who's in an, a, a catastrophic condition or an extremist condition. And we have to stop honoring that. When it's called death with dignity, I think we need to say, what? Are you saying that my grandfather who died naturally in his own bed didn't die a dignified death? Because that's the clear implication. And what you see now happening in the media, in, the, in popular culture, in the movies and so forth, is an attempt to normalize suicide as the proper way to go. And we need to fight that at every turn. We also, I think, still need to talk about what has happened in places where assisted suicide and euthanasia have been legalized. This used to be called the slippery slope. And when I started this work and I would say, well, if you do this, it's going to end up this. Like for example, when I wrote in my piece in Newsweek, well, if you allow this, you're gonna end up with people uh, organ harvesting as a plum to society. I was accused of being alarmist. I was accused of being uh, you know, an extremist. Well. It's no longer a slippery slope argument, it's facts on the ground. So let me just go over just a few of the um, things that have occurred, uh, particularly in the last few years. The most radical assisted suicide uh, license is in Germany. And that occurred because the, the highest court in Germany basically said, uh, conjured out of nothing, basically said that there is a constitutional right to commit suicide in Germany. And an ancillary aspect of that is a constitutional right to seek assistance and to be assisted in suicide. The German court also said that it doesn't have to be a doctor or even a medical professional, that anyone has a right to assist anyone who wants to commit suicide. And the German court said, we cannot uh, look judge why people want to commit suicide because it's a basic aspect of human dignity that if you want to become dead you have the right to become dead in fact um they said the individual this is a quote 
the individual decision to end their own life based on how they personally define quality of life and a meaningful existence eludes any evaluation on the basis of general values, religious dogmas, societal norms for dealing with life and death or consideration of objective rationality. So what Germany has done, the German court, has imposed upon German society death on demand. Death on demand, which is what I've been saying is the ultimate goal and the ultimate, uh, even if that's not what is necessarily intended, but it's unavoidable because of the logic of the beliefs of assisted suicide. That is that killing is an acceptable answer to human suffering. Well, once you decide that killing is an acceptable answer to human suffering, very soon killing the sufferer is it becomes the paradigm and the idea of um, what it counts as suffering that justifies killing expands. How can it not? Because there are a lot of people who suffer far more acutely than people with terminal illnesses and for a far longer period. So how can you say if killing is an acceptable answer to human suffering if somebody is terminally ill, that it might and should not also be an acceptable answer to somebody who would suffer for a longer period. And in fact, that's how you get to the uh, killing a psychiatrist saying that we should be able to euthanize mentally ill people because some of the people who suffer the worst over the longest period of time are people who are not ill in the sense of having cancer or some other disease, but are, are seriously mentally ill. And to show you the uh, coldness of the assisted suicide movement, I was in a debate in Santa Barbara against um, uh, the people in the Hemlock Society and so forth. And uh, one of them, one at the, during the question and answer session, a woman who was clearly mentally ill, I mean, you could tell by looking at her, got up and uh, she said, why shouldn't I be able to be out of my suffering? I'm not, I don't have cancer, but I'm mentally ill. Why shouldn't I be able to get out of my suffering? And the audience applauded. They were applauding her desire to commit suicide. I was just appalled. I mean, what we need to do is uphold people, uplift people intervene to help people, help people get through the darkness, not just say, yeah, you're right, you should go too. So, so these are, these are and, and by the way, that's not a religious question. That's a human rights question. That's a basic human decency question. So let's go on with what's been happening lately. Austria, an Austria court just issued a uh, ruling similar to the German court, that there's a right to commit suicide. That was not a high court, so hopefully there'll be an appeal and we'll see where that goes. Spain, the Spain parliament uh, just uh, legalized voluntary euthanasia on the basis of a serious or incurable illness. Well, diabetes is an incurable illness. It's a serious illness. So these, uh, we, we see a constant loosening of definitions uh, from uh, starting out, well, it's only going to be for the itsy bitsy teeny group of people, and and they continually try to expand it because it's not about terminal illness, it's about suffering, and it's about uh, basically the belief that death is better than life under certain circumstances. Portugal uh, is on the verge of legalizing euthanasia as well. They still have a little bit to go in their legislative process. Uh, New Zealand, uh, this was really disheartening. Uh, for years, we've been fighting uh, in New Zealand to keep uh, New Zealand from legalizing assisted suicide. So they put it to a, um, a referendum and 65% of the people said that they wanted assisted suicide. Now, I, I'm, you know, I live in the East Coast of the United States. I don't know how effective the opposition campaign was. I suspect they weren't able to really get traction in terms of uh, getting arguments that might appeal to a secular society out there. But the idea that 65% are now so afraid of suffering and illness that they want legalized assisted suicide is truly appalling and something we have to deal with. And of course, in Australia, you've got Victoria, which has legalized assisted suicide. And, and now I believe Western Australia is doing so as well or has done so as well. So we're finding a, a real metastasizing of this agenda. Uh, in the Netherlands, we know what's happened in the Netherlands. And when I started this work in 92, 93, uh, Netherlands, it was technically illegal for euthanasia, but it was allowed through kind of a quasi-decriminalized system where if the doctor uh, did it, 
uh, the um, they'd have to report themselves to the coroner, and then there would be no no action taken, and so forth. And it was like a force majeure. That is, it's supposedly the only way to eliminate suffering is to kill the patient, which, by the way, is a false premise, because there there are always ways to alleviate suffering. You may not be able to eliminate all suffering, but we can always do some alleviation, and we can help keep people going in terms of life. And that doesn't necessarily mean inflicting intensive care units on people. People have the right to say no to unwanted medical treatment, which brings up another point. There's a lot of confusion in the public mind, I think, between being hooked up to machines against your will, uh, which of course none of us support, and uh, assisted suicide and euthanasia. These are different things. We all have the right to refuse unwanted medical treatment. And of course, in hospice, you, you generally don't uh, um, ask for that kind of um, uh, intervention. Although in the United States, you're not allowed to, but Dame Cecily Saunders said to me, that's a mistake. And a lot of people get into hospice too late in the United States because they, as she, as she put it, she said, they look on it as a, as a situation where it's abandon all hope, all ye who enter here. Because once you, in the United States, you have to make the choice between hospice and uh, curative treatment. That's a cruel choice and it shouldn't be there. Most people who go into hospice don't want that uh, uh, extensive caregiving or extensive intervention. But when you tell them they can't have it, it scares people and it scares families. And we need to do away with that. And I know that there are some pilot projects now uh, to do that. And by the way, some studies have shown that it's actually cost effective to permit those kind of interventions because people will go into hospice earlier, which tends to be less expensive. And they often do not want that because they're receiving such good care in hospice. Why upset the apple cart? Uh, so the Netherlands has gone uh, since the 70s when they started this from killing the terminally ill who asked for it to the chronically ill who asked for it to people with disabilities who asked for it to the elderly who asked for it to people who don't ask for it. It's called termination without request or consent because pretty soon at some point suffering becomes the prime agenda rather than choice, quote unquote, or, or request. Uh, the mentally ill, as I mentioned earlier, uh, can be and are euthanized in the Netherlands as well as Belgium. Uh, infants in the Netherlands are, we have infanticide, active infanticide under what's called the Groningen Protocol, G-R-O-N-I-N-G-E-N. -E and if you uh, aren't familiar with it, you can look it up. Uh, and the fact that they, the doctors are allowed to, even though it's not technically legal, kill babies in their bassinets and babies that are not just terminally ill, but babies with serious disabilities, to me is a profound human rights violation. And yet uh, we, we still look at the Netherlands somehow as this rational society. It's becoming a monstrous society when you, when you are not living an optimal life. It's becoming, a, in my view, a Stepford society where there's a great deal, I've been there of course, a great deal of civility, uh, but there, there doesn't seem to be a lot of true compassion in my view. And I think at some point we have to think about what does legalizing a uh, killing uh, do to a society? What does it do to the, to the soul of a society, if you will, or the uh, value system of a society, if you don't like to term, use the term soul? Uh, so the Netherlands is, is um, a real problem. In fact, one case really illustrates it that happened recently because they now allow in the Netherlands um, people to be killed who have dementia if they ask ahead of time in a writing to be euthanized once they become incompetent. And there was a woman who had done that and she'd said to her doctor, but I want to be the one to decide when. Well, she never did. And so the doctor decided, well, this is the time for her to die and brought the family to kill her. The woman, the doctor drugged her patient's coffee. The woman fell asleep. The lethal pres uh, injection procedure was commenced and the woman woke up, saw what was happening and tried to fight to stay alive. The doctor asked the family to hold her down, which the family did so that she could be dispatched, which is what happened. Uh, there was at first the um, authorities, the euthanasia authorities said, well, you know, uh, she had nothing but good faith, the doctor, so we're not going to do anything. But there was a, an outcry. Uh, Alex uh, yelled and screamed, I did, and so did many, many others, 
Finally, there was a prosecution and she was found not guilty because she'd acted in good faith. And then what did the authorities do? Well, they changed the law to say, well, if somebody's uh, um, incompetent, you can drug them ahead of time, which was against the law beforehand. Oh, and the doctor can decide. So what you see in the Netherlands is when they when the actual practice runs up against a boundary that's supposed to hold, the boundary yields. And that continually happens. Uh, and uh, so there's no age limit now in the Netherlands. There's no age limit in uh, Belgium, which has, has jumped off the uh, cliff with the great uh, alacrity and great joy. Uh, I'm sure Alex will talk a lot about it because I'm running out of time, I see, and I want to have time for questions. Uh, out of, um, by the way, short-winded is not my strong suit. <laughs> um, uh, Joe Massarelli can tell you that because she's uh, had me speak. Hi, Joe. Uh, the um, Canada, uh, I guess, is the one shock I've had since I started was when Canada's Supreme Court imposed euthanasia on the entire country, how enthusiastically the medical establishment jumped into it. Even uh, nurse practitioners writing letters saying we should be allowed to kill too, which is what has occurred. So something happens uh, with regard to uh, euthanasia when it's legalized. And, and the Canadian experience, which really alarms me because Canada is the United States' so uh, closest cousin. I mean, you know, we're very close in terms of cultures. Uh, it's very alarming what happens. And then we can get into, I don't know, Alex, if you're going to be talking about medical conscience, but the next step now, and it's already happened in Ontario, is that uh, there's going to be the attempt, attempt, as happened to Dignity Hospice, to force doctors and other healthcare professionals to participate in the act of taking of human life, either by euthanizing or by doing an effective referral, what they call, which means a referral to a doctor that you know is willing to kill. And this is true even if it's a, if somebody, let's say, is a Catholic and they believe it's a cardinal sin to kill, uh, a court in, of appeals in Ontario has said that the conjured right to um, receive any legal health care in Canada overcomes the charter right, which gives every Canadian a freedom of conscience and religion. So the death agenda actually can come to uh, overcome explicit constitutional protections uh, against being forced to do things such as this. And I think there could be a, a massive brain drain of very competent and effective doctors who are going to say, well, I don't want to kill, so I'm just going to retire. You know, I may have been an oncologist for 30 years, but I'm not going to put myself in that position. So I'm going to take a retirement 10 years earlier than I might, than I might have otherwise. So I'm going to close um, here. And I just want to close with one story and then take some questions if anybody has any. Um, the first patient I ever had as a hospice was a fellow named, a hospice volunteer was a fellow named Ernie. Now Ernie was this wonderful old Italian gentleman, about 92, and he'd had a very uh, catastrophic uh, heart failure, uh, a congestive heart failure. And so the first time, and this was my first patient, I was really nervous when I went in to meet him. I'd had eight weeks of training to be a volunteer and it's not like they just throw you in. And uh, so I went in to meet Ernie and, as soon, and he was living with his son and his uh, daughter-in-law uh, in Ernie's old house. And as soon as they closed the door, Ernie fell into my arms crying. And he said, I want to die. I want to die. I want to die. And I said, Ernie, why do you want to die? He said, I'm a burden. I'm a burden. <coughs> Realize that assisted suicide is sold to, uh, through fear-mongering of uncontrollable pain. That's not why people ask to be killed. They asked to be killed for existential issues, such as what Ernie was experiencing. He was so worried about being a burden that he would rather die than burden his son. So we always have to call out people when they say, oh, it's about pain. No, it's not. It's very rarely about pain. I said, but Ernie, your son loves you. He's here. You're not a burden. I'm a burden. I'm a burden. He, he was distraught, I'm, I'm telling you. Um, and I uh, would visit Ernie once a week. And it would always be on different days of the week. And I began to notice Ernie's uh, mood began to pick up. Uh, people were coming to his home and they were dropping off the souffles and the cookies. And I realized 
you know, Ernie must have given a lot of love to that neighborhood because he was receiving it. Maybe love is like when you act, engage in an act of love, it's like putting it in a savings account that will come back to you. So a lot of people were coming to Ernie. They were reaching out to Ernie and Ernie's son and his daughter-in-law. And there was this one fellow in particular. I don't remember his name because this was in the late 90s. But let's call him Joe. And Joe would, had a very heavy voice, and he was an old, old friend of Ernie's. And every time I was at Ernie's house, Joe would come over, which meant Joe was coming over probably every day or most days because I wasn't always there on the same day of the week. And so I would always leave them in the living room and I'd go into another room. And Joe had a very heavy voice. And I would always hear, Ernie, you got to fight, Ernie, you got to fight. And then eventually I lost Ernie. He didn't die. He got better and he got kicked out of hospice. And on my last day, when I was with him, it was a great happy day. And he was in a great mood. And he, he was an old Italian gentleman and he played the mandolin for me. And then he said, Wesley, you know my friend Joe? And I said, yeah, I know Joe. He said, you stay away from Joe, Wesley. I said, why? He said, he's an undertaker. <laughs> that was a wonderful story. But I can tell you that if assisted suicide had been legal at, that at the time that I first met Ernie, he would have asked for the pills. And he would have qualified for the pills. And he never would have lived to have seen the outpouring of love that he received. And he never would have lived to actually be kicked out of hospice, which doesn't happen to most people, but does happen to a few. So I think Ernie is a, is a, is a great and important story because it shows us that while there's life, there's still hope. And while there's life, there's still things that can be done to help people and include people and not isolate people and that when assisted suicide is legalized, you're going to have for sure some people who might not have even died, but will never know because they took the pills or took the jab. So we have to come up with more stories. The other side is very adept at stories and the media promotes it. We have to find ways to promote contrary stories that are just, that are heartwarming, that are important, that are compassionate, and reveal that the true people who care about suffering, sick, disabled people are the anti-assisted suicide folk, not the pro-euthanasia. So I'll end there. Thank you very much for coming to this uh, meeting. Uh, if you want to uh, uh, read my articles, I'm, I, I, I pour them out. Uh, they're available on Google and so forth, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Eva has a question here about uh, Bill C-7. I know you've seen Bill C-7 because you've commented on it, Wesley. And, and uh, Eva is, is a leader in the disability community. So she wants you to comment on Bill C-7. Uh, I see so many bills. Remind me which one that is. Oh, uh, Bill C-7 is the Canadian bill that expands uh, euthanasia. So uh, uh, the, you know, the Quebec thought. courts strike down that your natural death has to be reasonably foreseeable. But Bill right. C-7 even goes further than that. Right. And it, it would also allow the... Uh, um, people who have dementia to order themselves killed. Well, you just see what's happening in Canada with C7. And the problem, of course, for any Canadian who wants to, to limit the scope of euthanasia is that the original uh, court ruling was so expansive in terms of what it said should be included that the law that the parliament actually passed um, requiring reasonable foreseeability which of course is as loosey and goosey as it gets anyway, probably is unconstitutional under Canadian Supreme Court ruling. So I don't see any way to limit right now um, the, the spreading and the, and the um, seeping of euthanasia into uh, people with serious disabilities uh, and people with uh, cognitive disabilities if they ask ahead of time. Um, but I do think that is a good place to, to try to, to hold the line and certainly delay because when you say this is discrimination against people with disabilities, I do think that that has an impact. And uh, I noticed that C7 did not go through as smoothly as people expected. So you keep up that fight. And remember, and I think this is important, people will often say to me, can we win, Wesley? Can we win? And my response is always this, our point is not to win, our point is to save lives. And the more we put up the resistance and the more we 
point out how uncompassionate euthanasia and assisted suicide are, the more lives we save, even to the point where if it sweeps the world and still legal, we are going to keep pounding the drum because unless they're willing to start dragging people out of their homes and killing them, we can still save lives. Uh, so uh, C7 shows that no matter what the false promises of euthanasia advocates that, that will always just have guidelines to protect against abuse, those guidelines do not hold. Once a society generally accepts killing as an answer to human suffering, it will expand. And, we're, and in the United States, we've had a better experience because we've been still able to generally um, not allow that euthanasia consciousness to sweep the country, but you're already now beginning to see some expansion. For example, Washington State's trying to expand its, um, its law to uh, do away with waiting periods and so forth. Um, so yeah, I mean, C7 is a, is a classic example and we can use it. Any promise they make is false because as soon as that gets accepted, the so-called guidelines are suddenly turned into obstacles and barriers to the good death. And, and we now have enough experience on the ground to prove it's true. They can't say it's just slippery slope argumentation because we can say, no, it's not slippery slope, it's facts on the ground. That's what's happened almost every time. And we can prove it through um, empirical evidence. Yeah, and sadly, uh, Wesley, you probably agree with this. Um... Canada has now become the example of how, you know, using Canada as the example is actually a good way to fight assisted suicide in the U.S. Agree. because of what's happened. You know, you don't have to talk about the Netherlands because the Americans will often say, well, that's Europe, you know, Europeans, whatever. Right. But Canada. Um, right. When I, used to, when I used to bring up Netherlands and Belgium, the response of the pro people was always, oh, but that's Europe. We're not like that. Well, now I say, well, Canada is as close to a culture of the United States as exists in the world. In fact, if you guys hadn't beat us at Quebec, you'd be part of the United States. So uh, it's, um, it's, it's really an important point that Canada shows the lethal risk my country faces. And, uh, and of course, if the United States collapses, well, we're, we're, I think we have probably the most effective opposition in my country because the euthanasia consciousness still hasn't um, swept the country. And that's why we have to use the word suicide because the, the, the people who uh, want to allow this know that there, there is an, um, a general uh, opposition to suicide. Yeah. And that's why they don't want to use the proper words. As he made a comment about uh, uh, Washington State's uh, law to expand the assisted suicide law, their, their bill, I mean, to expand assisted suicide in Washington State, and I've written about that. But New Mexico, it's interesting how the assisted suicide lobby works. New Mexico's bill to legalize assisted suicide, in fact, uses the exact same language as the Washington State expansion bill. So New Mexico is not willing to take the step. They're, they're wanting to go all out and uh, join the expansion of assisted you, you suicide. Often, immediately. You often see that, that the initial um, uh, legislative definitions always expand and then sometimes their idea is well well our compromises will back off but what they're really after is exactly what Alex said they want to make it as loose and open as possible because it's not about terminal illness we can never concede that it's about terminal illness because people are afraid of dying and so forth but it's very clearly not about assist about terminal illness and in fact in uh, most of the people where euthanasia is legal it doesn't require terminal illness.